Son of a gun, where are we at? Dan Adamson here, and we're talking about, uh, in our last segment, about the legal, ethical, and professional issues in information management. The second half of this presentation, we're going to talk about the laws. Just before the break, we learned that there's five things that have to happen for company policy to become the individual policy for that company and that company only. Now we're going to talk about the laws that suddenly when those laws are passed, they have the effect of covering all companies. We're going to start with the four types of laws. The first type of law is civil law. It comprises a wide variety of laws that govern a nation or a state and deal with the relationships and the conflicts between organizational entities and people. The second kind of law is criminal law. It addresses activities and conduct harmful to society and is actively enforced by the state. Law can also be categorized as private or public law. Private law encompasses family law, commercial law, labor law, and regulates the relationships between individuals and organizations. Public law, as you might guess, regulates the structure and administration of government agencies and the relationships with citizens, employees, and other governments. Public laws include criminal law, administrative law, which we'll learn about in a later segment, and constitutional law. But let's talk about relevant laws in the U.S. that deal with information management. Historically, the United States has been a leader in the development and implementation of information security legislation to prevent misuse and exploitation of information and information technology. The following present the most important laws that apply to information security. General computer laws. There are several key laws relevant to the field of information security and particular interest to those who live and work in the United States. In 1986, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act became the cornerstone of many computer-related federal laws and enforcement efforts. It was amended in 1996 by the National Information Infrastructure Protection Act, which modified several sections of the previous act and increased penalties for selected crimes. Now let's talk about that for a second. Why would we need to amend a law that's already been put in place? Well, let's first of all remember that we're talking about informational technology, informational uh, everything that has to do with our lives today, which basically means the computer. Please understand that we never even used computers majorly in this country until, until 1985. And after 1985, we started to pass laws, and even though they were certainly meant to be uh, something that we could hang our hat on, it quickly became important that they be amended to increase the penalties because the penalties weren't enough to stop perpetrators of information fraud. And so we, we looked at the, the, for a, a change in the law. Not only that, if we look into the future, in the not too distant future, all the laws that we have on the books may not even be relevant anymore as information technology moves into even a bigger, broader plane, more technical, uh, more sophisticated, and the old laws may not even be important anymore, and then we'll create new laws for the particular situation that has to be looked upon. The punishment for the National Information Infrastructure Protection Act uh, uh, under the statute, it increased the fines and took imprisonment up to 20 years or both. The severity of the penalty depends upon the value of the information obtained. Think about it for a second. Do you think that the legislators, as they're passing these laws, just simply say, well, we're going to give them five years for this or 10 years in prison for that? No, they look at thresholds, and based upon those thresholds, then they try to match the penalty to those thresholds. And so if someone is in violation of the National Information Infrastructure Protection Act, they want to know was the purpose of the criminal act for purposes of commercial advantage? Was it one company stealing from another company? That doesn't seem very right. So we're going to increase uh, that if there's been commercial advantage as a result of that. Or they're going to look at the private financial gain. Did someone in an organization steal information and sell it for money? That seems to be kind of a drastic step. Someone just 
lining their pockets with cash at the expense of some company, we're going to give them closer to the 20 years instead of closer to two or three years. Was it in furtherance of a criminal act? Think about that. Were there other criminal acts that were involved? Was it dealing with someone that was working for the mafia that was looking at lining their pockets? Was it looking at something that could have been treasonous by selling the information to another government? If the furtherance of another criminal act was involved, then there's going to be all sorts of uh, in, enhanced penalties, enhanced fines uh, for that kind of act, uh, activity. In this previous law, along with many others, was further modified by the U.S. Patriot Act of 2001. We've heard of the U.S. Patriot Act. It simply gave the United States uh, a greater latitude to check on what its citizens were doing in an effort to try and find perpetrators of terrorism. But let's also remember that terrorism has many, many forms. It's not just cutting people's heads off and, uh, and uh, having roadside bombs. It could also be something as critical and as serious as uh, interfering with, say, the U.S. electric grid and creating some sort of a virus or some sort of a, uh, a, a, a computer activity that could shut down the power in the United States. Maybe no one would be killed, but millions of people would be affected. So the U.S. Patriot Act came along and increased penalties even further and gave the United States government greater latitude to look at all forms of terrorism, not just physical forms, but information and technological forms. The U.S. Patriot Act was amended by the U.S. Patriot Act Improvement and Reauthorization that took 14 of the 16 things that had been done in the original act and beefed them up and reinstituted them so as they move forward uh, 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 these things would be covered. And again, not just for physical acts but also for informational terrorist acts. Uh, also uh, reset the expiration date written into the law or so-called so, so sunset clauses uh, for certain wiretaps under the Foreign Surveillance, uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978 or FISA. FISA simply says that if you're going to look at this information, you have to have a court order and that some of this information is so classified that we have to have a special court called a FISA court that will issue these wiretaps, that will issue these subpoenas, that will issue these uh, court orders to get this information so that we can run down and hunt down these criminals as, as it happens. Another key law is the Computer Security Act of 1987. Notice the date, 1987, two years. As the, company, as the country started to really get into computer technology and the uh, capturing of huge databases and every aspect of our lives suddenly became attached and closely related to computers. It was one of the first attempts to protect federal computer systems by establishing minimal acceptable security practices. That law has been amended several times. Uh, privacy policy has become one of the hottest topics in the informational security at the beginning of the 21st century. Many organizations are collecting, swapping, and selling personal information as a commodity, and many people are looking to governments for, for protection of their privacy. The ability to collect information, combine, combine facts from separate sources, and merge it all with other information has resulted in database, databases of information that were were previously impossible to set up. Well, let's talk about privacy for just one second. Laws in this country are based upon the Constitution of the United States. And based upon the Constitution of the United States, then the legislature, Congress, can act on that Constitution to set up laws. Do you think that there is any aspect or any clause in the United States Constitution that, perfect, that protects the privacy of an individual, whether it be computer privacy, their data, their personal information, their credit card numbers, anything that has to do with a human being, do you think that there's anything that says that that privacy is protected in the United States Constitution? The answer is absolutely not. It's been created by Congress by taking little bits and pieces of the Constitution, cramming it all together, 
and saying if you take this part, this part, this part, and this part, the framers of the Constitution must have been talking about privacy. Therefore, we're going to act on privacy that is a requirement based upon our informational age, our computer age that we've moved into, and suddenly we have these laws that 30, 40, 50 years ago were, would have been absolutely ridiculous to think were necessary, now become an important part of our lives. Why? Because of things like theft, identity theft. Uh, related to the legislation on privacy, it's a growing body of law that deals only with identity theft. How do you steal someone's identity? If you look at those words by themselves, somehow the human being's identity is being ripped off of his visceral uh, being and taken away from him? No we suddenly realize that this identity goes away from the body and into a computer, and if it goes into a computer, that identity can be stolen to the detriment of the person who's had their identity stolen from them. But just think about the words sometimes, and you realize how far we've come in identifying things that just several decades ago would have been ridiculous to even thought, thought, thought to talk about. Identity theft now is a major consideration in this country and will continue to be as long as uh, computers store all of this information that tends to identify us as human beings with the rest of the world. Let's talk now about ethical considerations. Ethical and information management. Many if not most organizations have explicit rules corporate laws, governing ethical behavior in the workplace. For example, doctors and lawyers who commit egregious violations of their profession, canons of conduct can be removed from practice. But unlike the medical and legal fields, the information technology field in general and the information security field in particular do not have a binding code of ethics. No binding code of ethics? Well, someone ought to fix that, and they have! They have created the Ten Commandments of Ethical Considerations that every organization ought to think about if they're truly going to protect people's information. I'd like to go over these Ten Commandments. I think you'll find them pretty interesting. The first commandment, thou shalt not use a computer to harm other people. How in the world can a box on a desk hurt anyone? But we all know now that they can hurt people. They can hurt them mightily. A little box with a lot of on and off switches can cause harm to people that 40 years ago would have been unheard of. Thou shalt not interfere with other people's computer work. Sitting and typing on a computer, we have to protect that? Of course we do. Because as they type on that computer, they're creating software. They're creating something that 100 years ago we would have called a copyrighted uh, book. They're talking about creating something in that computer that can do marvelous things that are completely unheard of just several years ago. Third, thou shalt not snoop around in other people's computer files. Do you think there was ever a law when people had files that were in file drawers? Do you think that we needed to have a law that says people will not open a file drawer and look at files? But all of a sudden it's critical that we protect those same files once they become digitized, once they become uh, capable of being spread through the worldwide net? Absolutely. Fourth, thou shalt not use a computer to steal. Once again, stealing is a human function. That box that sits on the, on the desk can't steal anything. Only the person using that box can steal. But one of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not use a computer to steal. Five, thou shalt not use a computer to bear false witness. My word, that sounds religious. Can a computer have enough uh, hu uh, humanization that we have to worry about it bearing false witness? But think about what happens with, on, on Facebook, what happens on Twitter. People can bear false witness all day long and truly hurt people, drive people to, to commit suicide because the, the computer has allowed us to bear false witness. Six, thou shalt not copy or use proprietary software for which you have not paid. Hmm, that's interesting. Need to pay for someone else's efforts. Seven, 
Thou shalt not use other people's computer resources without authorization or proper compensation, sort of related to the one before. Eight, thou shalt not appropriate other people's intellectual output. Again, just like the copyright of the great American novel of, of several decades ago. Nine, thou shalt not think about, thou shalt think about the social consequences of the program you are writing or the system you are designing. Isn't that interesting? That goes directly to the dark web, uh, to uh, social media sites that are promoting terrorism. Thou shalt not do that is one of these Ten Commandments. And ten, final, on the Ten Commandments for the ethical considerations for information management, thou shalt always use a computer in ways that ensure consideration and respect for your fellow human beings. We've certainly put a lot of human characteristics on a computer and all of those human characteristics we find necessary to have ethical considerations over or both corporate policy and, uh, and US-wide laws to protect us from these dreadful things called computers and all that they can do. Deterring unethical and illegal behavior. There are three general causes of unethical and illegal behavior as it relates to information management. First is ignorance. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. However, ignorance of policy and procedure is. That just means that, uh, uh, that the corporation hasn't worked hard enough to get the employees smart enough so that they're not ignorant anymore. But if it's a law and there's ignorance, that's not an excuse. You can still be prosecuted for violation uh, of the laws that relates to information management. The most important method of deterrence is education that is accomplished by means of designing, publishing, and disseminating organizational policies and relevant laws, and also obtaining agreement to comply with these policies and laws from all members of an organization. Reminders, training, awareness programs keeps the policy information in front of the individual and thus better support retention and compliance. Second, these are the three causes of unethical and illegal behavior, accident. Individuals with authorization privileges to manage information within the organization are most likely to cause harm or damage by accident. Careful planning and control helps prevent accidental modifications to systems and data. Third, intent. Criminal or unethical intent goes to the state of mind of the person performing the act. It is often necessary to establish criminal intent to successfully prosecute offenders. Protecting a system against whose those with intent to cause harm or damage is best accomplished by means of technological controls, vigorous litig litigation, or prosecution if these controls fail. Whatever the cause for illegal, immoral, or unethical behavior, one thing is certain. It is the responsibility of information security personnel to do everything in their power to deter these acts and use policy, education, and training and technology to protect information systems. Well, isn't that interesting? If having a policy violation, an ethical violation, or a criminal law being violated is getting into the information itself, all of a sudden we have these security personnel that are the first line of defense in keeping them out. We, for the first time in U.S. history, have given a substrata of a corporate level the ability to stop crime. Because if those security policies, those security uh, uh, ways in which they keep the information from being stolen in the first place are so important, we've turned it over to a group of professionals that didn't even exist 30, 40 years ago. Many uh, security professionals understand the technology aspect of protection, but underestimate the value of policy. We know how important it is, but we don't know how to create the policy. It lines that company up to have their... their uh, uh, information stolen or misused. Uh, there are some ways though in which ultimately they can control it whether they have great systems or not. One is the fear of penalty. Potential offenders must fear the penalty. Two, there has to be a probability of getting caught. We're going to have enough safeguards in our uh, information protection that we're going to be able to see when there's been a violation of our policy and information is slipping out to the wrong people. And third, the policy of the penalty being 
uh, administered. Potential offenders must believe that the penalty will in fact be administered. So what we've talked about here in our last two segments are the legal, ethical, and professional issues in information management. We've looked at situations that may be illegal, may be against policy, or maybe none of the above. We're, we've talked about the fact that a whole new range of laws are in effect that were never in place just a few years ago and the importance of security in information management. I hope that you understand that in the years ahead this will only become more technical, more important, and more uh, 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 effort to stop and, and control the information that are on these computers uh, than almost anything else in, that we've ever seen before. In our next se section, we'll take a look at some other things that I think you'll find very interesting. Signing off for now.